tastes weird. <laughs> so, we covered quite a few rifles. That's true. Caused some anger. Hopefully. I think we should handle a bad handgun. That's true. So, and this, we're going to talk about a handgun that some people have reviewed very favorably. Yep. Uh, said very nice things about and communicated it to be a uh, gun that was in some way worth having. Yep. Oh, you didn't think. No, this is a this, this is, is a good one. This, actually, this is proof that we don't yeah. hate them all. That's, yeah, a good that's a good one. Actually, no. This is different. <laughs> this is the this is the different of good. Yes, this is a garbage ass gun. So, what do we even? I don't know. Where do we even start with that? So, <clears throat> this is the this is for for those who somehow don't know. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Sig three twenty or the M seventeen. Uh, as it's also known as, because for, for some insane reason, the military decided to make a bad decision and adopt a, a bad gun. And that's gone great for them so far. There's been ones that have cracked optics plates and had sights come off of guns. They've had polymer frames, which isn't even the frame. We'll get into that, but it's a chassis unit, and they've had those break, despite the fact that they shouldn't be getting loaded. And I'm sure it's because dudes are, like, chewing on them or whatever. <laughs> yeah. But uh, th- these are these are certainly not nearly as durable as even even the M9s that had been you know, run to the point that they were no longer reliable. Right. So a uh, very interesting decision and certainly an indication that the lowest bidder always wins. And isn't it weird that then SIG won the, the Spear program? Right. Interesting. Also, the the lowest bidder wins again. Isn't that weird? <laughs> <laughs> the worst possible offering always wins. Right. But uh, in that regard, this is actually just like the M14. It's a loser, but they adopted it. Right. Yeah, it had nothing going for it. Uh, in terms of the trials, or is people are like, oh, but the USW, like, so did all of the other right. contenders had a, a little dipshit chassis that you could put the thing into. There is there is some confusion as far as you know Sig being a company, where it's, there's been like three or four Sigs at this point, mm-hmm. and people are people are gr- grossly lost and lost in sort of what that means. So there was a SIG over in Germany, and then there was a SIG in Switzerland, and then there was a merger of the two, and then and then there was a SIG in the USA, and now the SIG in Europe doesn't exist anymore, except they make packaging and own boxcars for trains and stuff. It's right. Very, they're, they're an industrial conglomerate, so they owned a lot of stuff, including a gun company, which they evidently don't own anymore. So most of them are now made in the U.S., and it's yeah. SIG USA. Totally New different. Hampshire. Totally different company. There isn't always with you know, with these things. There isn't always a complete exchange of technical data because they're separate companies and they aren't necessarily entitled to share technical data. Mm-hmm. So as far as you know, people people have asked because there are guns that Sig makes that are ostensibly okay, like their sort of AK derivative things. You know the 550 family and series, which aren't made by Sig anymore. Right. <laughs> and then, you know, of course, Sig USA can't just make them here right. because. The, the different company made them. It's like it's like. Saying, well, but they did try with the five right. five six, and it was an unmitigated disaster. Right. People, didn't, people didn't care for those as much. Yeah. But you know, it's sort of like saying, well, why doesn't Remington just make retro ARs? Well, they never. They didn't make retro Colts. Yeah. Why, how, how would they? It's a, it's a different company. Yeah. And of course, there is sort of a, a parent sibling relationship there, where one company could tell the other what to do, but they aren't. You know, they, they aren't on like terms where like all of one's data and intellectual property. Is right, the and that's something that confuses. So it all goes to say is that it's not the same company. It's right. just like you know, you might be able to buy a M1A from Springfield, but it's not the same <laughs> Springfield, and it's certainly not the same gun. Uh, similarly, like people are always like, "Oh, you think Sig's no good? Guess you never shot a 210." Well, that's a fascinating <laughs> one, right? The 210, the gun that a bunch of Swiss engineers formed a conglomerate in France. To market to the French military, won the French military contract for then a Swiss company to later on be like, hey, can I have that back <laughs> and scale it up to nine mil? And then now suddenly, it, you know, those were military service. That right. were great. Those were fantastic guns. Uh, but now they make them in New Hampshire and they suck dog dick. Yeah, because <laughs> the originals they were making match grade guns with like super nice triggers and excellent yeah. slide to frame fit and you way better than any any military dude was ever going to shoot a handgun. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, this of course except you know, assuming that handguns have lots of military utility which they don't. Uh, not really. Yeah. In like 99.9% of cases the rifle is going to be the thing that gets used. So you know, having a having a 
you know, a target handgun effectively, a reliable one that's got some, it's got military characteristics, but as a target handgun at the end of the day, be a sidearm was kind of a, a weird call. Yeah. But, you know, sensibly those were good. It's, it's like having like a fancy 1911 race gun be the sidearm. W- you know, would the 2011 have been a better sidearm than this? Yes. Is the 2011 objectively the best choice for military sidearm? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. I mean, I don't even want to get into the whole drop safety nonsense. Yeah, the the, the long and short of that is uh, there, there's national there's, na- there, there's requirements that's promulgated as far as what it means for a gun to be drop safe, and it's sort of like this thing where like the government can set standards and then you can game those standards, like yeah. like with body armor, right? Where there's three A body armor that will only stop. 44 Magnum and like 9 millimeter from a carbine breezes through it and it's like, yeah. uh, isn't it supposed to stop? Well, it's only supposed to stop 9 mil from a 5 inch barrel. <laughs> so then there's all sorts of weirdness in there. And there's also level 3A that will stop 50 AE. It'll stop some, you know, some rifle threats, some subsonic rifle threats. And it's like, well, there's such a big difference there. And it's because, you know, the, the NIG standards for body armor are a lot, it might even be the NIG that promulgates the standards for drop safety as well. Right. But you know, the, the sting of testing for drop safety has, like, we drop it at this angle and from this height and, you know, these sorts of things. Meanwhile, these guns had an issue where if they were dropped at an angle that's not required to be tested, they would fire. And then SIG tried to say, nope, it's not possible. We drop safety tested them. We're not going to we're not going to address that. We're not going to warrant that. We're not going to we're going to pretend that it was not an issue. And then enough people had it happen. And then there was a guy on YouTube that, like, definitively showed right. it happening with, like, a live primer. And then SIG was like, oh, well, maybe this happens so you can voluntarily send your guns back to us and maybe we'll fix them or whatever. And evidently that fixed the issue, but then people have had all sorts of other weird Then the issues. trigger got even worse. Right. After that. The people have had all sorts of other issues with these guns, some of which may be to blame on hand loading and some of which may just sort of be like a, a gun-to-gun issue sort of a thing. But the, the gun has been mired in controversy ever since because SIG USA was like, yeah, it's not an issue, and then it turns out it was very much an issue. And instead of them, like, you know, it, it, at any point, they could have just got ahead of this, right. and instead they chose to be behind it the whole time, and they were just like, oh, yeah, whatever. This is the other thing. It's just ugly. Yeah, like, that's one thing I can't get over. Kind of as far it's, as first impressions, yeah. I, I do not care for how it looks at all. It looks terrible. Uh, and so the reason, like, this is my personal gun, and I bought it just because... The M17s, right? The specific M17s were purportedly returns from some test run, right, or something. Um, this was one of those, and and you know, I don't, I don't generally give a shit if my gun was used by some, you know, uh, supply depot, right, s- staff sergeant, you know. But uh, I just thought it was cool from a historical standpoint to have it, so I, so I did grab it, and. I'm just incredibly unimpressed. It's it's just intensely middling. Uh, there's one redeeming factor about these, um, and it's that well, there's a certain profession that like can't can't seem to stop <laughs> tagging themselves with, with these. Like they, they just cannot stop tagging yeah, themselves. The, 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 the funny, the funny, the funny. Ex- you know, the funny sort of conclusion, I guess, at least for now, conclusion mm-hmm. of the whole drop safety saga was once SIG admitted fault, a million different little, little like, uh, needle dick awful lawyers, like, they perk up and go, yeah. ooh, company admitted fault, let's sue them. Yeah. And so there's, like, a class action thing where a bunch of people who, like, almost certainly shot themselves yeah. with their guns <laughs> were like, oh, it went off on its own all by itself, right. and the company has admitted fault, like, there's something wrong with it, so, uh... I should be able entitled to compensation. You know, there, there's videos of multiple videos, weirdly enough, of cops who have shot themselves with their own 320s. In, in at least two of the three that I've seen, they were carrying the gun in their pocket, loaded without a holster, which is like, yeah, which is like, and that huh. was declared in the lawsuits, which is like, huh? I wonder how it fired. Hmm, that's so weird. The trigger guard just completely open. Mm-hmm. And uh, people have said, like, well, the you know, the weird thing is, like, they're like, oh, the SIG's trigger is so light that it could just go off on its own without the without the user yeah. intending it to, which it's got a it's got an awfully an awfully not great trigger. No. And of it's... course, the you know the, the the cope enthusiasts of these guns will go in the cope section and tell you how much better it is than a Glock, and then you shoot them side by side, and it's like, ah. it's like, guess what? I don't like the Glock either. It's, it's almost the exact same. Yeah. And as I understand it, these are full cock striker guns, aren't they? Are they? And I thought that was why they had the drop safety issue in the first place. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at that striker, and all I see is 
pure autism. Yeah, it's 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 like a very very weird design. It's, like, there's simple ways to do this, and they decided to do it different. Than they simple. did not do it. This, like, look at that half moon shape in there. It it doesn't make any sense. Because I thought these were full cock strikers, and compared to be. compared to other guns with full cock strikers, like the Walther, you know, P99 and its lineage. Mm-hmm. Uh, those things have incredible triggers. Like yeah. they, they have triggers on par with nice hammer guns. Yeah, this doesn't have a trigger on par with a nice hammer gun. It's literally just as bad as a Glock trigger. And the the fanboys will tell you that it's not that way, but it do be. It do be in fact. So let's take this chassis out, which you know it's so easy. You can do it in a half second, just like this. And yeah, there's the heart of the gun, and, and this is meant to be innovative. Um, is it? Well, so so there, there's two things that are very interesting with the chassis. You know, first off, just this isn't really one of the interesting things, but this chassis is legally the firearm, and this yeah. becomes the frame. Uh, the idea behind doing a chassis-based system is purportedly because it takes stress off of the frame and puts mm-hmm. it on a metal part. Still, the frames break, so that's weird. Yeah, and it's it's almost as if you're having to impart that stress into the plastic frame at some point. Right. <laughs> Maybe mm-hmm. that little plastic tab you inserted into at the back. And just sort of you know looking at this unit, it it looks cockamamie, yeah, uh, and really even somewhat unprofessional. You can sort of tell that. I imagine these are laser cut and then bent up into shape. But the funny thing is, is like this is far from the first gun to do this, and yes. uh, like you know the the Grendel P10 uh, has a little chassis and it's flat steel, so it's uh, much more elegantly put together. Uh, so so one of the other big issues with this chassis system is because. The chassis, so, so at least compared to a Glock, right? Over insertion with a Glock magazine and frame is accomplished by a lug that goes right where this chassis is. You want to know how over insertion is handled on the SIG 320? Of course, this magazine has the base plate yeah. on it, but with the factory base plates that don't have the extension, you know, this is all that keeps you from over inserting your magazines. So there's actually a large number of people who have you know, rammed their magazines into the gun hard enough that it bends the ejector. And once the ejector's bent, you can't get the slide on or off. The gun obviously won't work. And you've just sort of got to bend your ejector back once you, you manage to hammer your gun apart. Whereas with a Glock, there is an actual protrusion there in the rear of the frame. Right. There's, but, a, there's a stop on the magazine and on the frame, and it doesn't rely on your base plate being where it needs see, to. it's not going to let you go in much further than that. And so the issue, of course, these are the, the, the extended you know, factory extension magazines meant to go with this gun. Mm-hmm. But with the factory extended mags that they sell for these guns, they don't have mm-hmm. that over-travel stop, so they hit the uh, ejector bingus. And I believe on, the, on, you know, on these magazines that don't have the M17-specific base plate, you can over-insert them and, again, damage your... Uh, ejector as a result. Same thing with the P99. Yeah, I mean, that, that is how most polymer frame guns accomplish that. And so, why would they not? It, it's not as if they were dealing with too much mechanical complexity because look at that cartridge unit. Uh, you know, it's it's cockamamie, like you said. And so it's it's very strange. And it's, I mean, it's a documented issue that many people have run into is that these mags are possible to over-insert. The only thing that stops it is the base plate. Yeah, that works with the 1911, right? That's how the 1911 does it. But if you look at 1911 extended mags, you know, like the you know the ten, you know ten round mag guards or whatever, they still have a lug that they weld onto the magazine right there to ensure you can't over insert it. Now, if you do over insert it on a 1911, you have to really over insert it to the point of the you know, mag has to crash into the slide before it can hit the ejector. It's just sort of a a, a weird a weird feature, a quirk, if you will. But so let's say, saying it is a full cock striker gun, right? Look at the mechanical complexity of this striker. A 90 degree angle with a little tail. Yep. And with this, you accomplish double single action with a full cock striker and an incredible trigger pull. Look what they've done here. It's just, it's just sort of a mess. And with this, you accomplish miserable single stage. It's, it's just really only. not that nice. Yeah, and in terms of safety, I don't, I don't like how everything's back there. That gives you kind of like a narrow, yeah. Uh, the words escape me, but a, a narrow range of spots where you can like set your go and no go. And in general, the slide is just the design is just very unprofessional. It's, it, it is. It is. It look, it looks like something you would expect of a sort of tool room. Looks like type. something I made. Right. <laughs> like it's, it's like, oh, we need a little bit too heavy. We need a little bit more clearance here. Yeah. Just like ram an end mill into it. And be like, okay, it's clear. 
and then they just put the production guns into production with it being like a yep that that clearance is there because we didn't realize we need it until we were making parts. Yeah, it, it it's got what just looks like four different random end mill plunges, which is just great. I mean, I'm just sure. And then over here, right yeah, where like, these that, that's where the rails the the slide rails are cut. It just looks bad. You're, again, you're driving in end mills instead of just because we're CNC now. Instead of just having your your key seat cutter come in, you're doing this this weird shit. Whereas on a gun that was designed with CNC decades earlier, look at how clean and simple that is, without additional areas for like grime and cum to build up in. Uh, it's it's not well designed. The bore axis is yeah the, the, a little the, high. The, of course, we've we've avoided the conversation of the bore axis thus thus far, where. Right. Because of the way the chassis system works, the highest the web of your hand can get is severely limited compared to something like a Glock or a Walther, which allow you to get your hand quite a bit higher. Right. Uh, because, and that's kind of masked by the beaver tail. But the, right. The, the, that's taking up a lot of real estate there. And so, of course, with the... With the bore axis as high as it is, these things all feel... You know, even the compact version of this, the M18 or... 320 compacts, whatever the hell they call them. They, uh, they they all end up feeling to me a lot like a Glock 17, where it's like a long push every time. Right. Like if you shoot a 17 and a 19 side by side, the 19 is, you, even though it's got less slide travel, mm -hmm. feels better to shoot, even though it's a little bit snappier, because it snaps you back on target. Mm -hmm. Whereas this sort of feels like that 17, where it pushes yeah. you up and you sort of end right here. And you've got to, like, you, you have to very consciously push yourself back down every shot. Probably feels a lot like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I hate the takedown too. I hate the chassis system. Um, I just oh, but there is one cool thing I wanted to. Find. It's not cool. It's just kind of an interesting artifact of the legal requirements with a framer receiver. So when you make a framer receiver, you've got to have all of your markings on it, right? You've got to have your a serial number, your manufacturer's name, uh, and your city and state. And your model number. So you'll see here on the outside, we've got a serial number, right, which shows through the outside. We've got US 9mm M17, which isn't on all of these. But where does it say pig, pig power? On the inside. <laughs> on the inside of this plate, if you pull up the slide release, you see it's, it's uh, pressed in there, Sig Sauer Inc., Newington, New Hampshire town, United States of America. Isn't that? It is. It is have you of, noticed that? Yeah, it is sort of, sort of wretched. It's. I think it's kind of cute that they made it happen, right? right. But and then another seemingly random military assembly number in there. But like. And then if you're going to design a chassis, do you need to have yeah, why, why, that spring hanging It's on? so ugly. It's so bad. And it's just begging to get bent. Like, that just wants to get fucked up whenever you put it like, in Like, to me, that looks like something you'd have on the prototype gun when you're figuring out your trigger geometry, and then later you'd, like, not make it terrible. This literally looks like the little pucks. Remember when I was designing the P99 frame? Yeah. The printed one? I would, I would print little pucks like this just to test out the trigger geometry. And they would look exactly like this. But those were prototypes. It turns out you could have won a military contract with that. Yeah, why didn't I? <laughs> right, because I probably couldn't have bid to lose money on each one to then convince pigs to buy them. And then have fun getting that in. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta get around that. You just try, you, does it, does I had to do so many of these. Go the no, well, yes, it does. It does. We try, go on, get the poison. I used to do a bunch of these because I manufactured a, a special model for California. That inspires confidence. We have to like make it, make it creaking crack. Oh my god! Having fun so much. Wow, that's so stupid. There you go. That's, <laughs> you such, a, that's such a 
you compare that to the way that you because know, the, the same sort of mechanism is present on the Smith and Wesson, right? All of their MP auto loaders, except it's not anywhere near that bad because it's just got a little key on it, so you just stick it straight in and then rotate it and it locks in place. Yeah, it's sort of like bizarre edge that doesn't seem. Of course, that is the only thing that holds your chassis into your frame, which is well, that and the little tab on the back, right? But like, you, you yeah. only have one thing that like constrains yeah. it in all three directions. Yeah. What's our what's our secret here? I don't fucking know. Do it until it goes. That's. <laughs> There you oh, go. you just have to push it down a lot because it's because it's special. There you go. Yeah, flip. Gotta put it on the thing. That's a pig. And then sometimes when you put them together, the the bolt hold open doesn't work. Right. Uh, but this one seems to be fine. But yeah. Tastes weird. <laughs> want this? No. <laughs> you know what the dog awful thing about these is for me? What? I shoot them really well. <laughs> just I, my buddy's got one, and I've 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 probably put about a thousand rounds just through his. I shoot them. I shoot them really well. But God, I do not. I do not care for them. Every time it, it just it, it yep. ends up pointed at the sky. Yep. Like you know, in, in the world of handguns, there's there's that talk about whether or not you can keep the dot mm -hmm. like in your view while you're shooting it. Right. Really, really good handguns, you can do it. Also, 22s. <laughs> uh, with this, there's no way. I don't even think with the super ultra upgraded trigger and the heavy extra weighted frame and with a compensator, you'd be doing it because this thing just wants to flip. There's no other way to say it. It is just a bad gun. Bad gun. But yeah, so that's the, the, the Pig Power Model 17. Bad gun. Bad gun. We'll see you guys next time. Now pick it up and see if it, the striker dropped. <laughs> Let's. No. <laughs> <laughs>